So again, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first annual New Brunswick Scottish History Lecture. My name is Danny Taylor and I'm co-chair of the New Brunswick Scottish History Project Committee. Just want to go through some house cleaning items uh, for those of you looking for the washrooms. They're right out the doors here to my left and the men's and wa ladies washrooms are right out just before you, you get to the main lobby. In case there's any emergencies, the emergency exit is right in the back of the, of the room here. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the session this evening is being recorded and will be uploaded to uh, YouTube. Um, I want to thank the committee for all the work that has gone into putting this together. Uh, if you only understand all the things that went on in the background just to, to get this going, it's, we talked about it a few months ago, but most of the work happened in, in just in the last few, uh, few weeks to, to make sure this happened this evening. Um, I'd like to call upon on Dave Morrison, uh, President of the Fredericton Society of St. Andrew, to introduce our, our guest lecture this evening. Um, before I do, I just want to mention everybody should have one of these cards on their seat. And uh, what it, it's just a little bit of information about the, the New Brunswick Scottish History website and all the information that you can find online and the information that will be coming soon. So, and we actually just launched uh, um, a fundraising campaign uh, on April the 6th on Tartan Day to, to help keep that site free and for people to use it uh, for research. So keep that in mind. And anyway, I'll call upon Dave Morrison and thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's both an honor and a pleasure for me to be here this evening when Dan asked that I introduce Coral, this very special lady. And she has such a, a resume that I had to write it all down, so please forgive me for having to read it, because she is, has, is impressive, as you can see. Uh, we are pleased to have as our speaker for the inaugural Tartan Day Lecture, a figure well known in the historical and heritage, and now the Scottish communities of the province. Our speaker, Cora Lavorna, Lavornia, has been serving as research consultant to the NB Scottish History .ca site in recent months. She is currently a PhD candidate at UMB studying New Brunswick education history. Before that she completed a Bachelor of Arts degree at UMB St. John and I believe you were raised in St. John as well Carol, Coral. And followed by a Master of Arts degree in history from UMB Fredericton. She holds a Bachelor of Education degree from St. Thomas University with a specialty in elementary educa education. Coral has taught Canadian history and the history of the North American family at UMB. Currently she's teaching Irish culture at St. Thomas, where her classroom is, and I quote, steeped in ginger ale and leprechaun trickery. Perhaps uh, Coral will explain that further to you. Over the past few years, Coral has developed games for and with elementary school students and she has brought this passion to the NB Scottish History product, Project in an effort to make our Scottish history appeal to children and of all ages. Uh, she's also, I'm told by my nephew Barry, that she's uh, oh, uh, uh, d d worked with the Past Region Museum as a past museum manager, curator, researcher, and writer for the city of Fredericton, built heritage history projects, a step on tour bus, bus history travel guide with a broad and thorough knowledge of New Brunswick and Fredericton's history. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, our speaker, Coral Lavornia. I want to thank you all for coming tonight and sharing my passion for the past. What I wanted to do for this inaugural lecture, I wanted to lead off with something rather sensational and salacious, and I hope you will agree that I have. As you can see, we are talking about murder tonight. So without any further ado, please let me get started. I cannot stop moving. These words uttered in alarm were Catherine McRae's last words. Her physician, Dr. James Christie, quickly summoned, tried in vain to comfort the dying woman. Given a pillow so that she could rest on the kitchen floor, Mrs. McRae convulsed uncontrollably, her body rigid and contorted. Moments later, she succumbed, dying an undeniably 
horrible death. Her final words and frightening symptoms had aroused Dr. Christie's suspicions. A middle-aged woman of reasonably good health, Mrs. McRae's unexpected death shocked friends and family, leaving many to mourn her loss. While the newspaper carried word of Mrs. McRae's sudden and sad passing, the concerned physician took his suspicions and a small package to the forensic analyst in St. John, William F. Best. The forensic expert confirmed the physician's fears. Mrs. McRae did not die a natural death. She had, in fact, been murdered. The insidious weapon of choice was poison, strychnine, to be precise. What followed was an incredible but true Victorian crime drama ripped right from the pages of the so-called sensation novels, the best-selling page turners of the day, which often featured poisoning plot as a device feature. This was not a novel. Fact blended with fiction as the criminal case unfolded. Within days of Mrs. McRae's de demise, four intended targets were identified and the single alleged poisoner would be apprehended. Amongst the complex cast of characters in this shocking murder case, the two primary medical professionals, one of the targets, the sole victim, and the alleged poisoner were all of Scottish descent. And the plot, or the plot device, thickens. On the 2nd of October, 1889, Jessie Robertson, herself of Scotch descent, was a servant in the McRae household. She answered a knock at the door. It was the postman. He delivered a small package, a white box, three inches square by one inch thick. It was addressed to Reverend McRae, wrapped with string. Jessie Robertson, who had been in the employ of the McRae's for just a month, brought the package to Mrs. McRae. Upon opening, she found a delightful assortment of confectionery. There were a dozen candies in the small box, delicate and exquisite and thoroughly tempting. Though Mrs. McRae sampled only one of the poisoned candies, each had been laced with enough strychnine to kill. Even if her suspicions had been aroused, once consumed, there was no antidote for strychnine poisoning. Mrs. McRae had no chance of surviving. And what's worse, she was not even the intended target. Her husband was, but he was not the only one. Here we have the targets for poisoning. As news spread about Mrs. McRae's untimely death and the manner of her death, reports surfaced about other similar packages having been sent through the mail. Three other boxes of confectionery had been delivered that day, all of them addressed in the same hand. Apparently, a single poisoner was at work, whose crime was in fact religiously motivated. The poisoner had hatched a fiendish plot to kill prominent St. John clergymen, having sent poisoned candy to each Anglican, Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian ministers. So all of these were the targets of the poisoner. Reverend Dr. McRae, Presbyterian minister, was born in Nova Scotia, but pursued his studies in Edinburgh and Aberdeen, Scotland. After his ordination, he went to Nova Scotia and then to Newfoundland, where he married his wife, Catherine. Together, they had 13 children. They later settled in St. John, where Mrs. McRae became a prominent and popular member of the community. Her death was a shock to all who knew her since she had been in good health and in good spirits the Sunday at church before her unfortunate death. Not surprisingly, sensational headlines and salacious reporting were the order of the day, and the muckraking accounts did not disappoint. Under the headline, Poisoned, was the typical following account of the case. You can see it right in the middle there. Mrs. McRae, the victim of an awful crime, fiendish attempt to kill three St. John clergymen by poisoned confectionery through the mails. And here's the opening part of that article. 
A thrill of horror ran through the city last evening as the news spread that Mrs. McRae, the estimable wife of Reverend Dr. McRae, whose recent death carried sorrow to a wide circle of relatives and friends, had been carried off by poison. That, in brief, she had fallen victim to one of the foulest crimes ever perpetrated in this community. And the horror evoked by the murder of Mrs. McRae was intensified when it became known that a deliberate attempt had been made by means of poison confectionery sent through the mails to kill three prominent St. John clergymen. In the end, it would actually be four, but originally all they knew was that there were three targets, but there would be four in total. As you can well imagine, this murderous plot rocked the St. John community, and soon rumors and theories ran rampant. Wild speculation was fueled by the greatest accelerant of all, fear. People are products of their time, and in the 19th century, Victorians had particular fears and obsessions, especially those surrounding death and dying. This fear was a reaction to the unknown or to uncertainty. Victorians had a seemingly irrational fear of murder by poison. Me too. Uh, and that murderous plots could be disguised as death by disease or natural causes, that you could have murder go undiscovered or undetected. Fear everywhere. At the heart of the 19th century preoccupation with murder by poison was the fear of undiscovered crime and that criminals walked among us undetected, free at any time to kill again successfully. Sometimes with poisoning, the symptoms could present as natural causes or disease, accelerating the fear of this dreaded crime. It was both personal and insidious. By the 1840s, toxicology emerged as the first modern forensic science. This would actually help allay some of the fears Victorians had about murder by poison. Aided by science, physicians and scientists discovered how to distinguish between symptoms of poisoning and death by disease. By the middle of the century, scientists had developed tests to detect the presence of poison, particularly for arsenic and strychnine, the most common poisons used to murder. Although these scientific advances could help allay the fear of murder by poison, its prevalence as a plotting and plot device in sensation novels kept the fear of undetected murder high in public imagination. So kept reading these stories, these pulp fiction stories, were helping to continue this unfounded fear that at any time you could be the victim. Cases of murder by poison that were brought to trial, though highly sensationalized and exploited by the gutter press, were in fact rare. There was the infamous case of William Palmer, an English physician who was convicted in 1856 of using strychnine to poison not only his colleague, but reportedly a number of his family members. Such cases would linger in public memory, keeping the fear of this type of murder alive. Now, switching to the United States, Manhattan in particular, between 1860 and 1890, there were only two cases of poisoning murder trials, only two in those 30 years. That would actually increase over the next decade with six new cases that would actually go to trial. So it's rather significant then that in 1889, St. John, there was a murder by poison trial, giving rise to all the fears that Victorians had about murder, death, and crime detection. There was a murderer in their midst, and having someone punished the, for the crime was paramount. However, the question is, was justice served at this time or was another unfortunate victim made? This will be yours to decide. Two days after Mrs. McRae's death, it was already reported that, quote, there is reason to believe that the authorities are on the track of the party who sent the candy through the mails and that his arrest is likely to take place at any moment. Early speculation in the Fredericton papers identified the culprit as female. Uh, not so uncommon since this was the traditional, uh, let's say, identity of the poisoner. Um, but there was no such whisperings 
in the St. John coverage. As I said, the 19th century poisoner was typically female, both in crime novels and in reality. One study of 19th century crime suggests that seven out of 10 poisoners were in fact female. The early identification of a female assailant would fit the stereotype then, but it was also suggested that the handwriting on the boxes which contained the poison candies was also feminine. In fact, the entire case would hinge on handwriting analysis, yet another new emergent forensic science used in the apprehension and prosecution of criminals. So you have toxicology coming to the fore and handwriting analysis, and these will come together in this cutting edge 19th century case of murder by poison. However, a suspect, a male suspect, was soon in hand. As it was reported, quote, on Saturday, the 5th of October, the Crown curtailed the liberty of a young man named William MacDonald on what they considered was justifiable grounds. What are those justifiable grounds? They would slowly spill out into the media the reasons by which the authorities had decided that William MacDonald was the culprit. William J. MacDonald, son of Jacob E. and Elmira MacDonald of St. John, worked in a drugstore where poison could be procured. Not only that, but the formerly moral and religious young man had been known in recent times to express anti-religious sentiments. Evidently, MacDonald had experienced this conversion while committed to the Provincial Lunatic Asylum. MacDonald had lived in Montreal for a short while, having moved there with his father. Upon his father's death in October 1888, just a year prior, William returned to New Brunswick, where he attempted suicide by walking into the harbor. He was confined to the asylum for a few months, during which time his religious views apparently underwent a tremendous shift and change. Three of the four ministers, who were targets, who received poison candy, had preached at the asylum while MacDonald was committed. The other intended victim had conducted the services at the funeral of MacDonald's brother-in-law, Mayor Barker of St. John, who had died in office one month after he won the election in July of 1889. The Fredericton Press suggested that the late mayor's sudden death might have been the result of poisoning and that the body should be exhumed for examination. Though that did not happen, it serves as proof of the prevalent fear of murder undetected. MacDonald was becoming flypaper for unsolved or even potential crimes. Now to further complicate matters, an unidentified poisoner had terrified and terrorized Galt and Toronto in 1888 in a manner similar to this case by mailing poisoned candy to a number of unrelated victims. That poisoner was never caught. The fact that MacDonald had lived in Montreal at that time raised suspicion that he was either the culprit or that he had simply been inspired by that crime. The fact that that poisoner had never been caught. No connection between MacDonald and the unsolved poisonings in Ontario was ever established, even though inquiries were made. Unfortunately, MacDonald was caught in a cloud of suspicion, and each hearing and trial only confirmed his guilt, though he did protest his innocence. And you can see right there, he does say in the one on the, four, the far end, I am not guilty. The circumstantial evidence mounted against MacDonald, and he appeared to have means, motive, and opportunity. He worked in a drugstore with access to poisons. There was a missing bottle of strychnine unaccounted for in that store. And he was known to publicly express anti-religious views, clearly. However, the boxes these at least gave some of these circumstantial reasons for why uh, McDonald was apprehended, but it would be the boxes that would be the key piece of evidence in the case against McDonald. The boxes were not manufactured locally, and in fact, they originated in Aberdeen, Scotland. 
there was no explanation ever provided as to why McDonald, had he been the poisoner, why he would have procured boxes from there rather than locally. The candies themselves, each containing between one half and two grains of strychnine, were thoroughly examined and investigated. Uh, and William F. Best, the local uh, you know, analyst, the forensic analyst who had been employed in that occupation since 1878, he would do testing for the coroner's inquest. And uh, you know, it actually changes color from violet to blue to red. And that, is the, that shows you that uh, there is the presence of strychnine in every single candy in every single box had enough strychnine on each one to kill one person. Local confectioners denied that these candies came from their shops, with some even suggesting that the candies were of a variety not found in this province. The implication, of course, being that McDonald might be the poisoner still at large who terrorized Galt and Toronto in 1888, suggesting that if he didn't get the chocolates and the candies locally, he probably brought them with him from away, and he was continuing his poisoning reign of terror. Through subsequent examinations and testimony, it appeared that the candies were similar to those from a variety of candy makers in the city. And it was explicitly stated that none were from Ganong's. <laughs> Though the boxes were delivered through the mail, no one ever saw McDonald leave the boxes at the post office. They were on the counter the night before the delivery was made. And from the postage, it was determined that they were mailed from within the city. There was no physical evidence linking McDonald to the boxes, since fingerprinting is not yet part of forensic science. This would not yet be in practice until at least two years after this case. Uh, and fingerprinting would become a routine part of criminal investigation in Canada by the turn of the 20th century. So the only way to link McDonald to the boxes of poison candy was through handwriting analysis using the very brief addresses written on each box. Back in the day, addresses were very short. Um, the box delivered to the McRae household simply read, Reverend McRae, city. That was good enough to get it to him. So um, the box, uh, one of the boxes had originally been addressed to one of the other intended targets, addressed to 75 King Street, but was corrected to 70 King Street. All numbers and letters were examined to determine if the addresses on the boxes had been written in McDonald's hand. It had been noted from the beginning that the backhanded style used in addressing the boxes was an, a deliberate attempt to disguise the person's handwriting, which of course can go either way, as in, uh, you know, he's, it's either his handwriting or he's faking it. So, in the original uh, coroner's inquest, Mr. Kerr, who had taught penmanship at the Commercial College in St. John for 18 years, had been brought in to examine the handwriting. Mr. Kerr was quick to point out that he was not a handwriting analyst, um, but that you know, he could say with some certainty that there were similarities between Mr. McRae's, or between uh, the address on Mr. McRae's box, between his handwriting, McDonald's handwriting, and they were comparing it to account books at the store where he worked. They didn't actually have him write anything, they just used what they knew to be samples of his handwriting. For the grand jury trial, a handwriting expert had been brought in from Boston. And typical of the adversarial legal system, expert testimony was often in conflict or contentious. Now the reason that we have this up is because once you were finished with the coroner's inquest, there was actually a verdict rendered with the coroner's inquest, which sent it to the police magistrate court, and once that stage was passed, then it went to the grand jury. This is in fact the death certificate of Mrs. McRae, and vital stats had only started in 1888 in New Brunswick, her death in 1889. It's actually quite rare to have the verdict the verdict of the coroner's inquest is actually written on her death certificate. So this is actually word for word, the bit at the end, that is what came out of the coroner's inquest, identifying William J. McDonald as the poisoner 
according to. So it is on her death certificate. Okay, so handwriting experts during the grand jury trial, they would actually contradict each other. You would have one expert saying, yes, the handwriting is consistent. The other one would say, no, it's not. This was very typical, especially of murder by poison trials. It was usually medical experts who were the ones who had contradictory testimony, but in this case, uh, the toxicology was not in question. The handwriting was. This was the only way to pin this crime on William J. McDonald. So during all of McDonald's hearings, from the inquest to the police magistrate trial to the grand jury trial, McDonald always took notes in shorthand. Uh, this was actually his typical method of writing. Even when McDonald was arrested, he had pieces of paper on him containing poems and songs written in shorthand. I particularly find this interesting, and it was never really addressed, the fact that his usual method is to use shorthand, and the fact that everything about the case would hinge on his handwriting. Okay, the reporting. At every turn, it was salacious and highly prejudicial. McDonald's lawyer at one point complained about how injurious the news coverage was to his client and his client's image. Reporters commented on McDonald's expressions, his demeanor, suggesting that whenever the poison candy boxes were presented as evidence, that he appeared far too curious about the boxes. And at breaks, he usually lingered a bit too long, a uh, lot much longer than what might have been expected out of just plain curiosity. McDonald was definitely tried and found guilty in the court of public opinion. There were examples of exaggeration or misrepresentation that was actually not through the fault of the media or exaggeration through uh, media accounts, which once said could not be undone. And in particular, this would actually be through a family member. Uh, McDonald's nephew, Arthur, Artie, uh, Artie Barker, he was about 11 years old, and as you can well imagine, he was sharing some perhaps tall tales with his friends. And he would tell his friends that his mother, uh, who was William J. McDonald's sister, Laura, he said to his friends that his mom received a box, just like the ones that everyone else had received, and it contained candy, and she threw it in the fire. He would actually be brought forward to provide this testimony and when Mrs. Laura Barker was brought forward to bring her side, she had a little bit of a different story to tell than what Artie had to say with his friends. She presented her side of Artie's story, and like I say, it was slightly different. She said that Artie had been pestering her all day, asking her, what would you do, what would you do, what would you do? If you got candy, what would you do, what would you do? Finally, she snapped at him saying, oh, don't bother me. I would throw it in the fire. Whose version is more accurate, Artie's or Laura's? When the sensational grand tri uh, jury trial concluded, the forensic evidence was apparently weighed against McDonald's mental state, and he was acquitted by reason of insanity. So here we have the jury agree. And so here we are now at the, you know, near the end of December 1889. They've decided, okay, you did it, but you were crazy when you did it. The only question that remained now was, where would he serve out his sentence? The lieutenant governor had the power to decide this, and there were some who called for McDonald's incarceration in the lunatic asylum that was associated with the Kingston Penitentiary in Ontario. However, the lieutenant governor did not have the power to place him there. He could only confine him someplace within New Brunswick. So the lieutenant governor basically took his sweet old time deciding what would happen with McDonald. And McDonald would languish in jail for a month after this verdict was rendered, while the lieutenant governor decided exactly where he should be placed. In the end, McDonald was sentenced to the provincial lunatic asylum the very same institution where he had been confined after his suicide attempt in 1888. 
There MacDonald remained for the rest of his natural life, where he died in April 1926, April 13th, actually. And here is his death certificate, which does take note that he died in the provincial hospital. Um, and of course, it has, you have two categories for occupation. The first one says that he had no occupation. Well, he wasn't working when he was in the asylum. And, uh, but it gives the occupation that he had had before that. And of course, it was that he was a clerk in uh, a drugstore. And it lists all, the, uh, you know, all of the other particulars uh, and the fact that his sister, uh, it was a different sister, Ada McDonald, she was the one who would come and see to his burial, uh, not his sister Laura, in fact. So here he would remain for the, re uh, the rest of his days. And by, you, by the time you hit 1926, the salacious nature of this case has clearly passed because his obituary makes absolutely no reference to this case at all. Um, let's turn to Reverend Dr. McRae. He bore this tragic event with grace and dignity. Just a few short months after his wife's death and a month after McDonald was committed to the asylum for his wife's murder, for McRae's wife's murder, McRae delivered a lecture at the Stone Church in St. John on Scottish humor. The newspaper reported that Quote, if his audience expected something bright and sparkling from him, they were not disappointed, for they were kept continually happy. I like this part of the story because it does show that through this tragedy, Mr. McRae, Dr. Reverend Dr. McRae, still had a light in his spirit. He would, in fact, remarry within a few years, and she would predecease him by a few months in 1909. Uh, McRae would actually go out to Calgary. That's where he would, uh, you know, that's where he died, and uh, and he was brought back here um, for burial, and uh, and he was well remembered. But also, his obituary did not make reference either to the fact that his first wife having been murdered. The salacious nature of this case had faded from public memory, which was kind of nice, a nice way to remember these people. Okay, this sensational case of murder by poison with a plot that involved a number of Scots, I ask you, the jury, was justice served or not? Thank you. I want to thank Coral very much. A round of applause again for Coral to take time out of her busy schedule. Does anybody have any questions regarding the lecture that she just gave? If so, the floor is open up, and I want to invite you over for oat cakes and coffee and for, uh, for co some conversation. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Coral, back to that time, the juries, would they be male, female, or a mixture? It was male. All male still at this point, yeah. So was Dr. McRae, in fact, the villain? Is he the villain? Yeah. I don't think so. Because um, remember, he's, he is a target. And there was never any suggestion that, uh, that he had anything to do with this, that unfortunately his wife was the sole unintended victim here. Um, and, but I still think that, I just don't think that the the evidence, both circumstantial or the hard evidence, I just don't think it was enough to convict. I think this was the fact that they needed a criminal. They needed a culprit. And if you square peg round hole it enough, William J. McDonald, he fit what they needed at the time. I, but I think McRae was actually, I think he was also a victim, unfortunately. I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. You know, they've been able to satisfy a public need to, you know, get a poisoner off the streets. You know, you have, because you have a public fear that can be running through uh, the streets of St. John. Again, people, every time they see a box, uh, you know, it's going to be a, you know, a box of poison candy. You know, having someone pay for the crime, whether or not they've actually, in fact, done the, the crime, 
that is good enough. And, uh, and yes, it probably did serve them, you know, knowing that, well, he was just ensconced in the, the lunatic asylum. Even though that was no good, you know, wasn't a good place either. <laughs> so. Was there any more attempts on uh, the victims? None. Did they all get the boxes at the same time? They, they did. Um, Shaw, um, who would be the fourth intended target, his did not seem to arrive until the following day. But three of the four arrived on the same day that Mrs. McRae ate her candy and died. So it would be on a Wednesday, and then the last one arrived on a Thursday. Very quickly, I know. So I'm not, I mean, without the internet, how did that happen? <laughs> I, and this was the thing too, um, some of the, the others, uh, there was someone who decided wasn't going to, thought somebody was just playing a prank on him so he didn't want to eat any of the chocolates. Um, the wife of one of the other intended victims, she had a funny feeling and so she decided, let's not even touch it, even though they let the servant girl kind of lick one. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> and she was going, eh, that tastes gross. And so they were like, okay. And, uh, and someone else actually did take a nibble off one of them and said there was a bitter taste. And that's the funny part, too, is that there would actually be a bit of a taste with strychnine and the fact that Mrs. McRae, she just popped that in, she just, you know, chowed that right down. Uh, you know, and, uh, and unfortunately, you know, it worked its magic very quickly. So you had these, and that was the thing, too, was that when it went to the public analyst, you know, I think this is how word started to spread. And because you had, within a day, these other attempted victims bringing forward and bringing their boxes of candy to the public analyst, and every single one of them tested positive for strychnine. Were, yeah. were they chocolates that had been like, injected or dipped in? <laughs> and, uh, yes, don't, because, oh my God, they go into such description about these lovely delicacies. Uh, you know, a couple of them are shaped as little hearts. Some of them were chocolates. Some of them were not hard candies, but something that you could actually, let's say, carve into, because one had shown evidence of, let's say, like a pen knife incision, in which, you know, the strychnine was just jammed in there. Because uh, some of them, like, they had like a bit of a film on them. So some of these, it was actually like the grains of strychnine that you could actually see. Um, but some of them, it was actually inserted in them. So, but there was, you know, the, the evidence was there, but clearly some people might have just thought it looked like, you know, frosting or something, or I might have, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Be like, oh, this is extra special. <laughs> so, but yes, um, this would be what it was, that they were actually made candies that were at times either, like, laced with, like, dipped in, or that it has been somehow carved, and, because there were caramel ones, and you could kind of push those in. So it was a, a variety of methods of trying to lace the, each individual candy with the strychnine. And you know what, we don't really have, we only have the newspaper accounts, but the newspaper accounts, they're, they're virtually the same because it's basically the court reporter uh, or the reporter who is there. And this is exactly, you know, you have, you're having the exact testimony, but it's also being delivered in such a way that is sensational. Because the reporters, this is why um, McDonald's lawyer was complaining about the news coverage, because they were actually describing how, like, because they could put whatever they want. They can't change the words, you know, of what people are saying in the courtroom, but they can paint McDonald, whatever way they want to. They can make him look guilty that it would be. Right? Absolutely. I mean, this is the thing. It's not, there's no objective truth here, right? And like you say, they are trying to sell newspapers. And I mean, the the headlines, you know, it was poisoned, tis murder, he's guilty, did he do it? It's all intended. And you know what's funny though, even though these are these sensationalist and uh, salacious headlines, they're not on the front page. Every single one of these was page three. So even though it was, you know, a very volatile case, it's still kind of buried almost halfway through the newspaper. Right. How many pharmacies would there have been in St. John? I mean, the, 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 
Do you know what? Uh, quite a few, because um, you had a lot of, let's say, multi-purpose shops, um, because you could get just about anything at this drugstore where William J. McDonald worked. Like you could get, like he worked in the drug part where you could get the poisons, but they also had boxes, they had, because like, again, they, they checked um, the Barker store, uh, which is where he worked, uh, you know, for the boxes that were used. Um, you could get just about anything. It was, uh, so I, I, would, I wouldn't even be able to hazard a guess, but I would have to say there would be many, many, many. And because I'm assuming your point being is, are they just assuming that it was at his one shop where they could get the strychnine? And apparently, obviously no, but the fact is from that shop at that time, one bottle of strychnine was missing. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You're only being charged. There's a difference. And this was the this was the problem too with McDonald because guess what? As soon as he was taken into custody, there were people right away because they interviewed everyone that he worked with, people that he knew, people that he hung around with, you know, this kind of thing, and people that he worked with. They were going, "Ooh, he looked weird on Saturday." And weird was the word used. They were saying because he was arrested on a Saturday, and they said he looked weird on Saturday. Clearly, he was guilty. I would, ha uh, I would have to say, you, you would have this poisoning fascination would, would last at least another couple of decades because you, you will still have, let's say, arsenic and old lace that, you know, the play from the 1930s, uh, you know, kind of a ubiquitous uh, depiction of, you know, these sweet little old ladies poisoning people, um, you know, because it would remain fodder for novels, for plots in movies, this kind of thing. And it really emerged out of just this Victorian fear. It was really kind of something that was baseless but it continued in this kind of public and popular memory well after the fact, even though it is probably the least um, you know, popular, let's say, of criminal trials, but it's because of the literature surrounding it and the mystery and, again, the fear that it would linger so long. Yeah, association. Absolutely. And, of course, you know, because it was a crime and murder that can be done without leaving any marks, you know, this was also part of the fear and that it was done, there was a secrecy involved and there was a personal uh, connection seemingly, especially if it was the female poisoner who's just going to put a little something into your tea, um, that you have these connections and it just, it just would continue and the fear would uh, you know, overtake a lot of people. And like I say, this is also why you needed to apprehend someone for the crime because then you don't have this at-large poisoner, it could be you, it could be you, it could be me. And, uh, you know, again, you have this, you know, fear just bubbling and percolating. Dave? Well, uh, just to uh, earlier comment where you indicated Mrs. Uh, Gray gobbled the top of the uh, Was she Scottish background as well? Yes. Because uh, I was raised by Scottish, and one of the traditions was, our sayings, waste not, want not, and that may have been <laughs> well, <laughs> well, then good for her. <laughs> She's doing right by her upbringing. <laughs> yeah. One of the most interesting parts of your talk is how society changes. So I often wonder what these people would think of our times where the American military forces were not in Iraq anymore. We need to have a place that for our doctors to practice. Where can we go? Chicago, the best battle Right. Airplanes, I mean, 
And like I say, we are a product of our time. You know. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.